Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, Democrats in the General Assembly flex their numerical advantage as the Maryland General Assembly opens for business. Chelsea Manning files for U.S. Senate race against Ben Cardin. And DACA, 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 will the Democrats shut down the government on behalf of the Dreamers? Stay tuned. Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by the past president of the Montgomery County branch of the NAACP, Henry Halestock. Education activist, Cynthia Rubenstein. Maryland political consultant and lobbyist, Sean Winkler. And back for a special appearance, political gadfly, Jerry Cave. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. As expected during an election year, the Maryland General Assembly opened for business with a flex of political muscle between the Republican governor and the Democratic-controlled legislature. The first salvo in this show of political power was exercised by the legislature, which vetoed to override two of Governor Hogan's vetoes from the 2017 legislative session. In doing so, the legislature underscored its progressive nature by requiring small businesses of 15 employees or more to give employees five days of paid sick leave, and the second veto, which was overturned, was the so-called ban the box bill, which prevents colleges from acting, asking excuse me, prospective students about their past criminal histories. Henry, why were these two bills such priorities? The sick leave mandate is not an insignificant cost to small businesses. That's a potential of 600 of hours of additional labor costs plus other employment fees. That's quite a burden. And then I don't understand the ban the box bill at all. So can you explain this to me? Well, I'll do my best. First of all, I, working day to day, having a family or becoming sick, not able to go to work, or your employer say go home because I don't want you infecting uh, other employees, is it, a tremendous burden on the individual because they're not sure how they're going to survive without be getting paid. Five days sick leave, I think, is, is very reasonable. I do understand that small businesses have problems with that because they may have a uh, issue as far as finances. However, we got to think about the, empl the employee themselves. Secondly, uh, as far as ban, ban the box, uh, why would an institution that is favoring improving an individual's uh, li uh, livelihood to worry about whether they were incarcerated or not. Uh, you have employers that are hiring uh, uh, murder. I understand that. Colleges. It's colleges, whether it's private or public. They shouldn't have to worry about that. The issue is that somebody comes out of being incarcerated, trying to improve their lives, let them, don't put the stigma on them, a uh, possibility of not being right. able to be uh, admitted into college. All right, well, you've explained it. I don't quite get it, but. Uh, thank you for... It's a number of things you don't quite get. Uh, well, <laughs> we all know that. Anyway. <laughs> we all know that. Sean, Governor Hogan responded with the submission of his proposed budget, which once again does not have any tax increases. It reduces fees that Maryland residents are forced to pay for services. And overall, who has the legislative leverage going into this session? Well, Casey, I actually think it's a stalemate. So regarding the budget, we have a very strong governor system. The legislature cannot subtract from the budget or excuse me, they cannot add to the budget. So what Hogan says, they cannot add anything into addition. So what that means is Hogan's going to hammer home his pocketbook, pocketbook issues, um, reducing fees, reducing taxes, which I think will set up his reelection campaign. On the Democratic front, they clearly just prove they can override what they want if they stick together with their supermajority. The flip side of that coin is, they own these issues, as Henry was describing. Is, if paid sick leave doesn't work out, you know, as Republicans are saying, that's something that could be tied around you know, the neck of the next you know, Democratic gubernatorial yeah, candidate. I, I know Hogan is trying to, really trying to win over five of the seats that the uh, Democrats are you know, holding to break down the majority. However, you have to understand a couple things. They're trying to work with them because they're, rather than do a 30-day um, implementation, of the uh, sick leave, 
they're saying let's do 90 days to give the, the employ employers opportunity to adjust, which is fine. I know Hogan was, on the other hand, trying to uh, say let's do a, a different uh, scenario. However, I, I think the biggest thing is that we're not looking at the individuals who are employed. Well, we're going to, we're going to run into the, a time problem here, so I want to go to mm -hmm. Cynthia here. Governor Hogan touted his commitment to education in this budget. $365 million dedicated to school construction, $6.5 billion for education, and Hogan is touting the fact that he even put more money into the budget than was mandated. That's a pretty good record to run on, isn't it? It is a pretty good record. It was a 1% increase, and this is something that will give um, gubernator Democratic gubernatorial candidates continuing mm -hmm. headaches because Larry Hogan continues to find the right balance between populist issues and satisfying traditional democratic issues like education. Um, so it, it's good for education. It makes it difficult for democratic candidates who want to take him out of the governor's Well, uh, now that you mention that, because we have a brand new poll from Gonzales, I'm going to ask Jerry about that. Two items of note came out this week. The Gonzales poll was released, which showed Governor Hogan had a 71% approval rating, and the Baltimore Sun reported that Mr. Hogan already has raised $9 million for his campaign, and that is more than all of his Democratic opponents combined. Will Governor Hogan be able to surf the blue wave <laughs> in November. Love that term. Good try at it, but let me tell you something. The 71 percent is, is completely ridiculous. The polls, people say one thing and do another. It means nothing. This is a 30 million dollar campaign if he wants to try and pull it off. It's going to be a bigger upset to get this because this is, these elections are all about turnout. And in the last one where he won, the turnout in Prince George's County and Monkey County, Montgomery County was low. And this time they're going to come out because it's existential. If he wins this, he sets the districting and they can get out of mm -hmm. this thing which has disenfranchised 40 percent of Republicans, 45 mm -hmm. percent for decades. So it's critical. The Democrats are going to come out loaded for bear for this. It's going to be a high turnout. Hogan's been the second smartest politician in the country. He has to do one thing and keep his mouth closed about Donald Trump <laughs> because he cannot afford to hurt to lose any votes, which he'll lose on that. Everything else he's done has been very smart. But it is going to be a fight to the finish. Well, it, it absolutely will be because there's some very strong candidates, mm -hmm. and when and when the field gets narrow, narrowed out after the primary, then it becomes a real race. Well, in that poll, Casey, in every single matchup, Hogan does not crack the 50 percent threshold. So we're mm -hmm. really talking a yep. toss-up race. The nominee is exactly. going to matter. I don't mm -hmm. think Democrats should run too far to the left here with a jealous or someone like that. But I think if they can get an establishment-type politician, Maryland is an establishment state. A Russian baker, I think, is a very strong challenge. And they have, they have to look beyond candidates? their traditional, we, if we win in Prince George's County, Baltimore City, and Montgomery County, then we win statewide. They mm -hmm. have to look beyond. They have to look at Baltimore okay. County. They have to look at Western Maryland, and they have mm -hmm. to look at the Eastern Shore. All right, well, I, wanna, I, wanna, I, don't, I don't want to bring his campaign manager back again, which was Martin O'Malley, <laughs> which won him the last election. <laughs> I will just, uh, we, we have a minute left in this segment. I want to go to one thing, which was the Maryland political landscape was shaken this week when noted whistleblower Chelsea Manning <laughs> announced that she was running for the U.S. Senate. Cynthia, is this for real? <laughs> this is for real. Um, it's interesting, the contrast between Chelsea Manning and Ben Cardin, who is well-liked, respected, has taken care of, and, um, of the interests of the federal workforce, and is um, not in any danger of being unseated. I'm interested to see what the primary issues are that Chelsea Manning will use to differentiate herself from Ben Cardin. Thank you. Sean, uh, two, 10 seconds. Does this help Republicans? It helps Republicans because now there's a chance. If Manning's the nominee, we could see potentially a Doug Jones type <laughs> situation that we just saw. It's extremely unlikely, but it's possible. <laughs> All right. When we come back from this short break, the Democrats in Congress seem poised to shut down the government over the DACA program. Stay tuned. And welcome back. <laughs> President Donald Trump, in one of his first actions in office, announced the end of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program known as DACA. The program was, was begun in 2012 as an executive order by former President Barack Obama, and the DACA program protects people brought to the United States illegally under the age of 16 from being immediately deported if they are picked up by immigration officials. In announcing the end of the program, 
he did, uh, President Trump based it on the questionable constitutionality of the DACA program. President Trump delayed the termination date for some months to allow Congress to act, and now the deadline is approaching in March. Cynthia, the DACA program affects between 800,000 who've registered and potentially 3 million people who have entered the country illegally. Democrats contend that it's immoral to deport individuals who came here as children and return them to a country that they have never known. Republicans counter that it's a nation of laws and we are ob obligated to enforce our laws. Who has the upper hand in this hotly emotional debate? Um, Democrats have the moral and um, upper hand, and the American people, by a sizable majority, support the DREAM Act and mm -hmm. finding a way for DACA young people to be able to stay, go to school, work in this country, and contribute to the United States of America. So um, I have hope that Democrats and certain Republicans will find a way to make this happen well before March so mm -hmm. that those 800,000 to 3 million people can continue to um, work towards being real contributors to our economy and to our American society. Jerry, you look pained by that question, by it's that answer. It's just ludicrous. I mean, Senator Schumer and Feinstein are on YouTube talking the same way that I'm talking, that illegal immigration diminishes wages, diminishes jobs, and if you do this DACA thing, they will never be able to enforce anything and, uh, and, and illegal immigration, and it's just, it's absurd. You're gonna, you all are doing it for the votes, and the stinking, rotten, donor-oriented Republicans want the cheap labor, cheap votes, cheap labor, and who pays the price? Working-class American citizens. It's disgraceful. That is not a moral issue. We cannot afford to be the welfare agency for Central America, South America, and the rest of the universe. Sean, I want to go to you now because there are those that, that advocate, as, as Cynthia has, is that, that the immigrants that are here today are innocent and that they deserve you know, consideration for that. But newly released crime data from Arizona indicates that in undocumented immigrants are at least 142 percent more likely to be, to be convicted of a crime and that while DACA individuals make up only 2 percent of the Arizona population, they make up 8 percent of the Arizona prison population. So the, do these statistics belay the myth that we just heard about, about the noble illegal immigrant. Well, Casey, I don't believe in myths, particularly when it makes one group seem better than another. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's led us down a lot of dangerous paths in the United States history. I'm sure illegal immigrants would have a, a bone to pick with that assertion. However, if the question is, should we you know, protect an extremely vulnerable minor population from being ripped from their classrooms or ripped from their workplace, the answer is yes. And, you know, and as Cynthia was mentioning, I'd argue it's not a political issue. This is a human rights issue yes. at this point. Yes. But, but it, there, there, there seems to be a difference of opinion because if, if you would travel to Canada and you overstayed your visa, would you expect to be there, to, to be able to reside there? Right, but that is not necessarily the issue with DACA, right? We're talking about, you know, children So their who parents are, did something wrong to them, and what we should do is put aside our, our second most important law, which is the integrity of our nation, put that aside because their parents supposedly did something wrong. And, and the Democrats don't care about this. They just want the votes. And they ought to be honest about it. It's, it's Everybody not, you knows know, they want the illegal immigration because they're you know, you're, you're talking law. You're talking laws now. And, and see, I was going to be quiet with this whole thing. But laws are not necessarily right for everyone at all times because there have been a time there where people looking like me couldn't go and, and drink in a water fountain because it was against the law. It was uh, against people state like law, me, but it people was, like it, it was uh, federal law, Trump's oh, state law, oh, it, it doesn't matter. rights, but not the, the rights of the federal to law. Rights the away. federal law turned their back on us for a while until we made it a big issue. And so don't California talk about that. And now right now we're trying to law. we're trying to make a big issue out of people who are coming here for a better life and everything, and their children are dragged with them, not to allow, be not to Henry, allow. Henry, ask, Henry, how many is too many? How many I mean, is too many? How many is too many? We have three, we have three, uh, estimates of three million illegal you know, DACA kids. That's just and like saying. And maybe 20 million illegal immigrants total. You want to you want to let in another 100 million? That's just like saying, no, you know, I mean, what, we only how have. How many is too many? Uh, you should, know, that's just we, like saying we, we only have, the we only you know, have 12 uh, lifeboats but we can't accommodate everybody. 
Who, who, who are we going to yeah, throw over? That's, 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 that's wrong. All right, so I want to we go, need oh, to work with that. We, we, we need to work, work with, with them. Okay, we'll work with that. Jerry, this dovetails into what we just finished up talking about. The impact of illegal immigration has on the effect of the African-American community has been hotly debated. Back in 1997, U.S. Senator Barbara Jordan, <laughs> then the chairwoman of the U.S. Commission on Immigration Reform, created by President Bill Clinton, asserted that illegal that illegal immigration harms the African-American community. The 1997 report that was issued recommended eliminating family-based immigration, the so-called chain migration policy, and in advocating eliminating the diversity lottery program and reducing the emission of low-skilled workers. So why have Democrats abandoned that position? That's the position of President Trump. The verbs are wrong. It hasn't been hotly debated. It's been totally ignored. This, there's no debate. Illegal immigration hurts working class and poor people, and there's a higher percentage of the black community in there. It hurts them more. The color's not black, it's blue. Donald Trump ran to help blue collar workers because their jobs have been torn away, their wages have been depressed, and that's what won in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. <laughs> and the black community would be doing this, but they've been lied to by the media that Republicans are all racist and so they can't even entertain voting for them. But this is, a, this is not a debatable issue. It does <laughs> hurt the black community more, and the Democratic Party it turned their back on the blue collar community, it cost them this election, and if they keep doing that to the black community, it's gonna cost them votes in there too. <laughs> Henry. Uh, Stephen yeah, Camer well, let's dovetail, Henry. Stephen Camaretta, director of research for the Center for Immigration Studies, concludes that African American men have been put in direct competition for American jobs against illegal and legal immigrants. The U.S. Census Bureau 2016 report on income and poverty in America concluded that real median household income by race that Hispanics now have a higher median household income than African Americans. So why then does the black community so strongly support illegal immigration? Because we, believe, we know that it's a systemic thing that's been going on in decades. We need to work with the system, not try to pick and pull and say it's because of this person or this race or these people. We have been underdeveloped for years. We have been unemployed uh, in the highest regard for years. We have been neglected in being able to improve our skills for years. You know, you look at the education system. Take Maryland right now. Uh, the unemployment as of last Friday was 10.3 something like that percent unemployment for African Americans. Okay. Now, you look at our educational system here in Maryland. Just I'm just taking Maryland since you took Arizona's uh, figures, and and look at what we have is a gap. But I don't call it a gap. I call it a chasm because each year it gets wider and wider. Okay, it's easy to find out who to discriminate when you stand out in, in a crowd. And we stand out, okay? And this oh, has yeah. been years. I don't care what you say. And this administration, although he may who have is, been trying been to go in into- Who's been in charge of, the, of Maryland politics for the last 30 years, Henry? No, the last it's, 150 It's been the years. Democratic Party that's it, been I'm in not talking, been in I am and not talking have, about they, any they party. Failed, I'm not talking about any failed, party. They have failed the whole I entire state of Maryland. I am not talking about any party. The I'm talking about the United States of Maryland, particularly Maryland, okay? We have been undercut for years. And don't put it on the Democrats. Don't put it on the Republicans. Who's been in charge? Just put it on in general government and politics because I don't care Henry, who is in got charge. Henry, held accountable. Okay? I, I hold the legislative body. Whoever is in charge is not looking at improving overall, especially us. They're trying to look at themselves. I mean, you know, right now, what, three more hours? We're going to have a government shutdown, right. who is it going to affect? Is it going to affect us the most? Who's in charge of it? It's the Republicans. No, it is but you're going to try to get us to get out. It is the Senate. I don't it is. To be it 60 is. Votes I hate politics. The bill I in the un Senate. I hate politics. The only thing, they only thing, they only thing I understand votes. is humanity. They need Democratic and votes is, to is pass that bill, and the Democrats yeah. won't vote for it. That's the Who's problem. in the majority? Who cares who's in the majority? If you, you have a, you if you are a, why can't it pass? If you why are can't it pass if, you if you're are, in the majority? If you because they don't have enough votes to so in the majority. So they need to they, work they, with they need Democrats Democratic to get votes. Votes. So, so why votes. won't Everybody why won't the Democrats? Why won't people work together to make things right for this United States? Why won't the Democrats? 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 Why won't the Democrats
instead of voting on behalf of illegal immigrants. Well, Casey, what about the six GOP senators who may even vote against this funding package? The fact of the matter is it's a bad package. It has yes. nothing to do with politics. They need to fix this system that's dragged on between DACA, between budgeting, Thank between you. our defense spending. Yes. It's broken, and yes. it's not going to be fixed, you know, on the back of federal workers. Yes. Unfortunately, it might be in the end. And then but. passing it off on one particular race or not. It's the it's system. Just one it's race, the Harry. system. It's no the system. Blaming one particular yes, race. you were. I don't want. Uh, yeah, we're, you were. We're, just we're, listen. We're Run the tape back race. and listen to it. Okay. I about race. Well, I said illegal aliens. That's not a race, Henry. <laughs> aliens are from the sky. Immigrants no, are from if here. You're, if you're, you're, you're there, that's a legal and I definition. And I want to bring up another worry. point. Quickly. African American community has had to operate under the auspices of decades and decades of systemic racism mm -hmm. yes. and under and built in under opportunity. Yes. And this is something that has has been So let's make it harder for them and bring in more illegals. I don't think you do this on the back of illegals. You look That's, at African Americans and you look at education yes. and economic opportunity and you yes. fix the system yes. to serve them. And you, you fix know, the you system of immigration. You're talking about do good, feel good stuff, and you never want to hold anybody accountable. You never want to look at the results of anything. And you I can't hold make decisions on intent. systems Jerry, accountable that set up I want to thank the you. inequities. I want, to, I want to thank you all for being here. This is obviously the most hotly debated political topic of our lifetime right now. And it shows on this, on this set how we have such a divergence of opinion. Stay tuned for Parting Shots when we come back. Don't ignore the subtext. It's on us to intervene in sexual assault. Because we can. Take the pledge at itsonus.org. And welcome back. Now with Parting Shots, Henry Hellstock. We have uh, been touting how great Maryland's uh, educational system uh, is in, in, uh, compared to the nation. However, we're not really the top because if you look at the real aspect of it, um, our students uh, in assessing what they have learned has really fallen short. We need to work on that and make it a, a better system for us to grow people who can come out and really work for this, these United States. Internationally, we're not doing well at all. Thank you, Henry. Cynthia Rubenstein, your parting shot, please. Um, I'm a Silver Spring resident, and after last week's gut punch of news that Discovery is leaving, oh. um, this week uh, the DMV got some hopeful news that the District of Columbia, Northern Virginia, and Montgomery oh. County are in the running for Amazon HQ2. So um, hopefully whoever, um, hopefully someone in the DMV will be able to become Amazon HQ2 because it will benefit the entire DMV. Thank so you, I Thank hope you, to see it. Sean Winkler, your party shot. Well, I want to take a minute to highlight this group uh, based in Baltimore, Transit Choices. Uh, and they're currently just have won a grant. We're implementing a digital campaign right now to educate residents on the TIGER program, um, which is a federal transportation funding program that helps connect residents to jobs, keeps Maryland's ports moving. Um, and a lot of great benefits, and we're excited to, to launch this campaign. Thank you, Sean. And Jerry Cave, you get to wrap it up. So I'm now living in New Orleans. People ask me where I'm from. I say I'm from Washington. They say, which one? I say the bad one. They don't never mistake which one I'm from. And the other thing I would like to say before I wrap it up, and thank you for having me on, Casey, and I was so proud to see that your name was absent on the fake news <laughs> award. <laughs> Congratulations. Not, not a chance of that one. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here today. In addition to the hotly contested debate uh, over DACA and, and the federal budget, today is also was the, also the Right for Life march in the, in, in the District of Columbia. And for the first time, uh, President Trump attended that rally and spoke to their rally. He's the first president to have done so. I think it's, it's an admirable statement because abortion rights are another hotly debated topic 
that we have uh, to contend with. I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank the panel. I want to thank the guests for tuning in each and every week to Montgomery County's hardest-hitting political talk show. For 21 This Week, I'm Casey Aiken.